Hi everyone, Wednesday's video got some stuff to get through as we start to gear up for Saturday's game against Ross County, another really important game, you know all of that stuff. It is really difficult to get used to this no midweek fixture carry on, we've been used to having two Celtic games every week, all season, and now that's been whittled down to just one, and it takes a bit of getting used to, fairly abnormal, I'm sure it'll be the same for the players, but then again, they don't have to come up with a different video idea every single day. Uh, so on that topic, let's do today's video, which I'm clearly buzzing for. Well, that is a little bit of a lie because I am quite excited. On today's video, we're going to chat about Carol Starfelt, who is, it's fair to say, by far the most criticised regular Celtic starter so far this season. He just seems to attract this whole bomb scare narrative, this narrative that he's not very good at all. And I want to fight against that a little bit today and bring you some of the stats and just the overall feelings to suggest that Carol Starfelt has actually been a very good Celtic player this season. Now, as we know, he does attract this narrative, mainly from the media. Obvious examples, I mean, even on, on Monday against Dundee United, Stephen Cragen, who was in co-coms for Premier Sports, was on Starfield's case more than any other player on the pitch. Michael Stewart clearly doesn't rate him either. He went for him during the cup final against Hibs, and Starfield is regularly spoken about in a negative context on shows like Sports Sound and Super Scoreboard. He's kind of the whipping boy. Well, today, Starfield was called back up to the Swedish national side, the 17th best country in the world. So he's clearly not the bomb scare that many in the media make him out to be. And if I'm honest, there are still sections of the Celtic support who haven't taken to Starfelt. We regularly have people in our comments who blame Starfelt seemingly any time Celtic concede a goal or draw or lose a match. But the reality is that Starfelt has been what I would regard as very good Celtic signing under Ange Postacoglu and I'm going to attempt to shed some light on that and explain why in today's video. Now first of all Starfelt has been one of Celtic's key players this season. He's played more minutes than all but two of Celtic's players, that's Joe Hart and Callum McGregor. He's played over 3,500 minutes which is equivalent to 40 games. Starfelt has had only one real injury this season when he missed five games in November. In those five games Celtic shipped eight goals in the following 12 games that Starfelt played when he came back we conceded just five goals. Overall, Starfelt has been one of the most consistent members of the best defence in the league, a defence that has conceded just 18 goals in 30 matches. Now, I got my calculator out and I believe that's an average of 0.6 goals conceded per match. If you actually take away the games when Starfelt wasn't playing, that goes down to 0.54 per match. So... He clearly improves the defence, but even overall, he's been part of the best defence in the league by a fair bit. The theory that Starfelt is rash and lets down Celtic regularly is one that's been peddled by a lot of people. It's not fair though. Other than the two yellow cards that he had in eight minutes at Ross County, which wasn't a great showing from Starfelt, I think we'd all admit, he has had only two other bookings in the league this season, and that's in a total of 26 matches. He's had none in the Cups and just one yellow card in nine European matches. People often label him as being unsure in possession, a bit of a calamity, a bomb scare, all of those terms have been used. Starfelt has actually completed more passes per 90 minutes than anyone else in the top flight. He averages just under 94 passes per match. Now, I know that just because it's the way Celtic play, that our defenders are going to have more of the ball. That's where we start most of our attacks. But that's the facts. Uh, he also has the highest pass completed percentage in the league, with 91.3% of his passes finding their target, which is just more than near beat on. Again, not bad for a guy who's apparently pretty unsure in possession. That's not to say that there aren't things that I think Starfelt can do better. I think he's looked a little bit unsure at times when he's been put up directly against a big physical striker. The cup final was an obvious example of that. There have been other ones as well. Often away from home as well. But he's definitely improved on this in his time at Celtic. And that's the one thing about Starfelt. You look at all his, I believe, metrics 
is, is what the statisticians call them, but I could be way off with that. You look at all of these different metrics and Starfelt is on the up in all of them pretty much. So he's a player who's clearly improving, who's growing and becoming a better player seemingly every match he plays for Celtic. So you don't really even know where the the, the glass ceiling is for Starfelt at the moment. I think he can go much better than he's even playing right now. I guess the final question to ponder when we're chatting about Starfelt is why is he ridiculed by so many including some Celtic fans. I think there is a tendency to assume that just because Ange's playing style is so attacking that the defence is going to be caught out and be lagging behind the attack, if that makes sense. To assume that the defence is the weak part of the team is probably something you would do because Ange talks about attacking at all times. But that's not the case with Celtic. I think people then look for a scapegoat in the defence. I mean, you look around at the other new signings, Joe Hart... Juranovic, Carter Vickers, they all came in right away and performed, I think from their debuts, pretty much all three of them. Starfelt's growth to become a Celtic first-teamer was a bit slower. He did get off to a rocky start, had some blunders, so I think that makes him an easy target. But the numbers that I've detailed in this video show that he is offering a lot to Celtic and he definitely deserved his call-up to the Swedish national team. And I think, as I say, Starfelt can get better. Um, I know I've listed some numbers, but it's about what you're watching as well. When you go and see a game, I'm actually continually impressed when I watch Starfield. I think he's really good in the ball. I think he can do more of the coming out with the ball because he's actually a very good passer. Um, I love when he's kind of coming down the left channel and he's playing it out to you know the left winger, Jota, or the left fullback. And I think he can be better at carrying the ball. But defensively, when you look at what he's brought to the team since he's come in, the fact he's been such a reliable player in terms of playing minutes, he has been a very good signing. So well done, Carol. Well done in your Swedish national team call-up. And you never know if things go well in these playoffs, we might see you at the World Cup at the end of the year. And maybe then those in the Scottish media will take notice of what's going on. Now, sticking with international stuff... News today that Dyson Maida and Rio Hatate have been called up for Japan. They're due to face Australia and Vietnam over the next fortnight. Jorgius Yakamakis also got some good news. He's been called back up to the Greece squad. They're facing Romania and Montgomery. Montgomery? Oh. Hi, Hamish. They're, they're facing Romania and Adam Montgomery. That, that's what's happening. Montenegro is obviously what I mean. Uh, Greece are now managed by Gus Poye, I should add. No Barkas in that Greece squad, uh, obviously. At the time of recording, we're still waiting to hear on the likes of Croatia, Australia and Israel naming their squads where Celtic players will almost certainly be involved. And finally, everyone, by... Uh, demand. Please welcome back the Scottish Premiership supercomputer, or most notably articles about it. Yes, it's usually reserved for when Rangers are top of the table. Our little cyber friend has returned and has some good news for Celtic's title bid. Just want to clarify right away that I am firmly taking the piss with this segment. Um, I don't actually believe that a computer can predict the future and call football matches. And yet, this wonderful system from the legends at 538 and their infamous SPI rating reckons it can project the result of a match as well as simulate whole seasons to arrive at the probability each team will win the league. It's worth saying that even this supercomputer can often be flawed, like at the start of the season when they gave Rangers a 64% chance of winning the Scottish Premiership and even at the turn of the year when that was as high as 77%. But how the tables have turned, quite literally, because we now have Celtic at the top, of course, with a 72% chance of winning the league, and we're forecasted to finish on 89 points, three ahead of Rangers. Now, Celtic can actually make it to 97 points in real life if we win all our matches, so 89 does seem a little bit on the low side. But who am I to argue with the wonderful supercomputer, especially when they're forecasting the scenario that we all want to see? Um, I'm going to leave that there, but I just thought I would chuck that in just to hopefully raise everyone's confidence a little bit, because who's going to argue with a computer? We're beginning to build up to Ross County from tomorrow onwards. We'll have Jackie McNamara back on the channel to chat to me and Ewan. So until then, have a wonderful day, especially if you're a supercomputer or indeed if your name's Carol Starfelt.